so this is one of my uh, favorite ideas because now we're gonna we're gonna move off of things that you've probably seen before um, with uh, not me you can work in groups for the final project or you can work alone so you can find a friend or not uh, up to three people but I won't assign you to a group um, so we're going to move away from things that you've probably seen. Now, if you've taken machine learning, you've probably talked about log regression. Um, but DCA, I know most of you have never done before. And then in the coming weeks, we're going to cover uh, conditional inference trees, which will be kind of an idea off of um, log regression here, and then um, do some other analyses like clustering and scaling. Okay. So tonight, we're going to talk about grammar. So overall, we're going to cover more about grammatical slots. A lot of the lectures kind of center on this idea of grammatical slots because they're so informative. If you think about natural language processing, a lot of the, the analyses focus on um, here's this verb, what can and cannot go around that verb, or here are these collocates, what can I do with them? Um, so we're going to keep kind of trucking along in that way. And then if you think about really fancy versions of, of deep learning or um, classification scenarios are using collocates and grammatical slots as an important part of their analysis. So clearly this is a, a key facet in computational linguistics. So we're going to do more of that. Um, and we're going to try to predict word choice. So how do we know when um, people will pick a specific word over another word? Uh, and what context do words find themselves in? Because the best uh, information you can learn about a word is the company that it keeps, the words around it. And so if I understand the context in which words appear, I can start to think about their meaning um, and disambiguate different versions of their meanings. Um, and if I can predict what words come in next, now I can start to build um, like simple search engines. The one that Google uses to predict the next word is is pretty complicated. It's a what people think it is, since it's a trade secret, is that it's a, a Monte Carlo Markov model, which is essentially a set of prior probabilities of what word should come next based on your previous searches in your um, current area of the world. So if people are searching for the flu in your area, area you're more likely to see that. Um, and if we make that whole problem simpler, it's essentially a log regression of the likelihood of each word coming next. Uh, and the, the key analysis here is to try to understand synonyms. Synonyms are really tricky for um, computer-based models because, in theory, there's no one reason, real particular reason, to pick one over the other, except maybe previous word frequency. Um, and so polysemy is when words have multiple meanings, Synonymy is where there are multiple words that mean one thing. So we're kind of working from the other direction, not thinking about each word's situation, but instead thinking when uh, do we pick one over the other? Are there specific scenarios where it's purposely going to be this word, and then and another scenario is going to be this other word? Um, and so it's essentially trying to figure out um, the context for each word. So if I have a sentence, I blanked to go to the mall this week, um, we can come up with words that would fit in that sentence. Right? So I plan, I am going to go, I have decided to go, um, So, and I did not remember what order these are in, so planned is clearly the most frequent option here. And what that implies is that I'm doing it later this week. I decided to go to the mall this week could have been past tense in the sense that you're telling a story about when you went. Right? Um, I planned to go this week is either happening in the future or I planned to go, but then the day was crappy and I didn't go. Right? So they they're clearly have their own context, but are somewhat synonyms. I scheduled to go to the mall this week. That's a bit more formal, so something that you have written down at a specific time. And I'm going to go is, uh, is probably the least formal, where it's more of a casual, I'm going to go do this this week. 
I'm forced to go. That's another good one. That has almost a different um, synonym context. Right? Uh, that implies you're going with someone else. Another example might be she is very, we could say pretty, is going to be the most likely word to fill in there. And that in itself is an interesting um, a grammatical slot question of why she should go with pretty. Um, and then we could think beautiful. Alluring. So when you throw in the last one there, you've, you've transformed from kind of casual language to more adult language, right? So often people say pretty in all contexts. Beautiful tends to be more for adults, and alluring is definitely um, a synonym but a different context. So can we use other facets of the sentence or the words uh, to determine which one goes where. Okay. And so sometimes maybe if I'm trying to write a um, more complex problem, like a chat box, um, I might have a list of synonyms and give them prior probabilities based on word frequency. So remember, if you don't know, the answer is frequency. Um, but I also might um, tell when the contexts are in those. And being able to predict which context is appropriate would be useful. So some other kind of examples, at least in English, we're going to have the example we're going to do is in Dutch, but um, may versus might. So when we pick I may go to the store versus I might go to the store um, depends on a level of certainty uh, of the speaker. Um, gown versus dress. This will tell you what type of party it is, right? So um, which is interesting because often if we think about, like, let's say high school, we're talking about I bought a prom dress. However, those tend to be more of the gown type. Right? You know, they're a little bit fancier, but this is a, a cola kit that's strongly tied right? in, in American culture anyway. Um, and generally, we think of ball gowns for fancy parties um, because we would often also say wedding dress. So dresses are less formal usually. Gowns are more formal. Um, unless we're talking about strong collicate pairs uh, that we might have analyzed last week, like wedding dress. Okay. So um, here it would not only depend on formality, but it would also depend on, on the probability of those pairs. Okay. And these are soda. This is one of my favorite examples because I'm from the land of the world um, where you would say Coke. Everything that's fizzy is a Coke, except water. Um, uh, and this is like the Texas southern region where every, and that's because I grew up close to a Dr. Pepper bottling plant and um, it's all just Coke. You go to the store, uh, I want a Coke. And the waitress is like, eh, what kind? Right. I'm going to go on Sprite. If you go up to New York and you say, I want a Coke, you're going to get a Coke. <laughs> so uh, soda is kind of the ubiquitous term. It's across the U.S., uh, mostly um, Midwest and West. Pop is definitely a Northeasterner's choice, and uh, Coke is definitely a Southerner's choice. So understanding those cultural variations in uh, word choice. And later in the semester, we'll talk about dialect um, a little bit more. So we're going to focus here on causative constructions. Um, and these are things like might have, get, cause. And how do people pick? which one of these to use because they're fairly interchangeable. Like I might get um, the handyman to fix my window. That was today's adventure. I have to get the handyman to fix my window. I caused the handyman to fix my window. That doesn't quite work, but when do we pick which one we want to use? Okay. So they're called causative constructions because there is some actor who is causing something on an actee. Maybe some terms for these. And these are conjugated verbs, meaning they, um, uh, conjugation is just the, the verb form. They're, they're um, so what I'm looking for here, auxiliary verbs, meaning um, they have to have uh, an extra. Right? So I am going, am and going are auxiliary verbs. They, they both have to kind of go together. Um, you don't have to say, I going to the store. 
and most of these are work the same way. So when I was saying I um, might get, I had to include both of these. Uh, and Southerners are the worst at this. Uh, like I find myself saying might could have a lot um, because I'm trying to flavor. I might have done something, but I might could have. Um, it's kind of a, um, a phrase that you would hear from from myself. Um, and then because they're auxiliary verbs, they often also require some sort of direct object, which is the actee or the person being acted upon, um, and a main verb. So have and get compare with um, some other specific verb like paint. Okay, or for me it was fix the window. Um, and they're called causatives when you are causing someone else to do the action or something else to do the action. It doesn't have to be a person. It's just easier to explain that way. Um, so it's not, it's when um, you're not doing the action. I didn't fix the window, but I got the handyman to fix the window. So I am not forcing him to, I paid him to do it. Um, but I'm having them someone do do something else. So it's a causative. I'm causing something to happen. But you, the the confusing part about this is you can cause something to happen to you. So um, you can say uh, uh, I reminded myself to write a check today for the said handyman, and so I'm causing the action on me. So I had him paint my house, had and paint, this is the auxiliary, um, the, the conjugated had with an auxiliary verb, so um, the direct object is him, and the indirect object, the what, is my house here. So we have to have all of these kind of uh, points here, the conjugated have or get um, with some other verb and a direct object. Okay. Uh, so I find these phrases super confusing uh, personally. I'm trying to use the terminology from the book, but the cause E is the actor. They're doing the action. So I've always heard this as the actee. person is acting up. That's the way I've always thought about it. Um, the cause er is the person requiring the action. So this is the act, um, the actor. So uh, whatever terminology helps you make, helps you understand this. But realize that there's a person who is um, do doing the action, and then the person who's forcing the action. Okay. So the cause E is the uh, doing the action, the cause ER is the person who's causing the action to happen. <clears throat> and so we're going to focus in on a pair of words in French, it's doen and letten, which is do and let in Dutch, which I'm probably butchering, but I'm going to Amsterdam, so I'm going to find out, right? So um, don't forget, in like a month, huh, uh, you'll have the day off because it'll be the 4th of July. And then the week after that, I'll send you a reminder about all this. But the week after that, we'll have a, um, a recorded lecture because Amsterdam's like seven hours ahead. And I'm not pretty at four in the morning. So uh, well, we're going to talk about do versus let. And if I can remember, I'll ask them if I'm butchering it. Um, do appears to be a direct causation. Let me make sure this is off. Okay, good. Heard my phone buzz. Um, do appears to be a, a focused causation. Now, this is not the same in English. Um, so this is often also going to be tied to culture, as you'll see here in a minute. But it's a like, I'm forcing you to. Okay. Um, and so the phrase from the book, which I find very funny, is if the energy is put in, the result is inevitable. It's kind of a weird translation of how do is interpreted in Dutch. Okay. Um, so he reminded me of my father. Okay. So he is the, um, the causer. He is causing the action to happen. I am being reminded. So I am the cause E. Okay. And so uh, this would be a do um, translation in Dutch because uh, so it doesn't have a direct have or get English version um, because the just the presence of him, the causation was involuntary. It just happened. 
whereas let is more of an indirect causation. So something like enablement, permission. I give you permission to do something. So an example, I let him paint my house. Kind of like you're doing them a favor. Um, it's still where he's doing the painting, so he's the causey. I'm the causer because I let him do the painting. So why do these things happen? Like, why do we have this sort of weird separation between different types of causative constructions? So what what socially or internally is going on in language that we need more than one of these, basically? <coughs> Okay, all right. Oh, one second, let me get a drink here. <coughs> uh, random catch in my throat. Okay. So why do these things happen? Um, and we think it's partially, and you'll see these variables, in, some of these variables in the data set we're going to work with, but um, it might be because of the difference in the verb type. So verbs are super important. They're the drivers of the sentence. Um, they determine uh, grammatical slots, right? So transitive and intransitive and dietative or ditransitive verbs um, determine what kinds of things can come before and after it. So it shouldn't be too surprising that um, the, the type of verb that gets conjugated with it determines which one you pick. Uh, because there's no particular reason why we should use have versus um, versus get in English or do versus let in Dutch, but because of their constant collocation, um, we've associated them with specific verb actions. So it might be a state verb, like a, a state that you are in, he made me upset, okay? or an action verb, right, where you are doing something. Um, I think being upset is doing something, but <clears throat> That's more of a mood verb. Um, could be the type of transitivity. Right? So transitivity meaning intransitive, no direct object required. Transitive, one direct object. Or dietive, uh, where's two direct objects? Or, or direct and indirect object. So um, these verb types require different types of um, noun phrases after them. It could be because of the action, the thing that's being caused. So is it involuntary? Does the cause E have control? Um, <clears throat> does the cause E act willingly? Remember, cause E is the person doing the action. Um, or is it involuntary? Or is it um, forced? So your I was forced to go. Um, how is the cause E affected in the sentence? So we can create categories for each of these. Oops, sorry. So we would code each of these as a specific variable type. <clears throat> so the bad thing about this type of, not logistic regression, but the bad thing about thinking about this type of question is that it does require us to read sentences and code them for these variables. So this is a little bit of a slow um, process because uh, you usually have multiple raters. And you're coding them for these types of things. Did the Kazi have control? Yes or no? How is the Kazi affected? You'd have categories you'd pick, etc. Um, now related to the person causing the action, uh, how direct is it? Is it an order? Um, how intentional is it? Is it accidental? I, if I remind people of someone, that's not really under my control. If I made them upset, maybe that was. Is it a natural activity or with effort? This is more um, uh, related to uh, normal day-to-day -day actions versus things that would not be part of your day-to-day -day actions is often how they get coded. So like I wash the dishes, um, that's not really one of these phrases, but that idea that would be a normal natural activity um, or um, a non-natural activity. An effortful activity would be like, I cleaned the house. I don't know. Like, this kind of depends on how they decide to code it. Um, and based on the sentences that they're using, they're talking more about like um, uh, 
basic day-to-day experiences versus things that you would have to go out of your way to do, like go to a concert. And then how much involvement they had in the activity. Right? So are you participating or are you just directly um, requiring that they do it? So if we look at uh, do versus let, we can get, start to add some category labels to these. So it might be inducive, where there's some sort of mental uh, causer, person requiring the action, to a mental causey. And by mental, we mean human, or right? a thinking person, um, or a thinking thing. And in that scenario, where they're both human, essentially, you tend to see let. Okay, it's more permissive. In a volitional um, uh, version, you would actually kind of see neither. Neither is, e they're equally likely, or um, you just don't see it as much, or it's a mental cause, or a human to a non-mental cause, like I let my car run. Um, here, these would be equally likely. Let is way more likely when it's too human. An effective um, one, where you have a non-mental causer, so my car, so mental cause, my car is making me angry. Uh, that would be more likely to be due. And so sometimes these examples don't work because the translation in Dutch doesn't work in English. Um, and then physical would be non-mental to non-mental, and that is more likely to be due as well. Okay. So we have these scenarios when we expect to see more let, uh, equally likely, probably more due, and probably more due. Uh, are they assumptions as per grammar or as per statistical? Um, I'm not totally following you. Um, so right now we're just kind of discussing how people, how you might code um, the variables involved in this sort of analysis where you're trying to predict word choice. And so based on previous work, it appears that the word choice is more likely for let when it's these two combinations. Um, it's not never do, but it is more likely to be let. So uh, this is kind of the prior probability of these, but they might interact with other variables. So this analysis allows us to see which scenarios each word is most likely. So hopefully that answered your question. Uh, so the way that they coded this, right? Yeah, it's a good question. So the way that the, the um, I think it's explained a little bit, but they're, they've taken sentences from Dutch speaking, um, newspapers, literature, etc., and had multiple coders um, came up with these categories, and you'll see the categories that are in the actual data set here in a minute, and had people code them as, this is an inducive scenario. It's mental to mental, so I'm going to label it as inducive, and then the word here is let. And so you're coding each sentence as a participant in the study for these different variables. And they usually have multiple people do it so that you have coherent, co consistent, consistent answer. Uh, yeah, I don't know that I would call it the study. I guess this is my background that the word study seems a little weird there, but it's based... Um, the analysis is based on a qualitative coding of the data. So people got together and coded these things. Um, I guess, suppose you could make computers do this sort of categorization as long as you had some strong rules about what they'd be. But if we're talking about straight normal linguistics, <laughs> it's done by hand. Yeah. Um, I would say if I were to do this sort of thing right now, um, uh, see the problem is we normally we have a degree in linguistics, like my degree is in computational linguistics, so it's cognitive science. So I got way more coding experience and even then it was less than you guys are getting. Um, uh, but if you're in straight linguistics, you probably have not 
touched a whole lot of code. Um, there are some newer programs that are doing some really cool things, but um, this kind of research is normally like, I have a book and I'm coding this by hand. <laughs> right. um, and so if I were to do it now, knowing what I know in R and Python, I would set up these rules, these rules would be agreed upon, and then I would tell it to code based on those. Um, even then, it would be really hard still to do this because you'd have to understand pronoun resolution, right, and know um, when in each scenario something was mental or non-mental. So it still would be hard. It almost depends on how many you want to code. It'd almost be easier to do it by hand. great question. Where does the data come from? All right, so switching into log. So if I have all of these, um, I have the data coded. Okay, let's say that's like part one. Part two would be how would I analyze this? And there are lots of ways. You could do some distinctive collecting analysis where you're looking at um, do versus every word that comes after it, right, or do with every word that comes before it. Uh, the nice thing about logistic regression is that I can use multiple variables. Okay. And we don't want to use regular regression because now we're dealing with a categorical outcome. Next week we'll talk about um, uh, phrase structure trees, I'm sorry, uh, conditional inference trees. And so that would be another way that we could actually do this same analysis. So uh, when the data has a categorical outcome, you have several options, and this is one of them. Okay. So Originally, when we talked about regression, we talked about predicting each person's continuous Y score. So this is their predicted score on the de dependent variable. It's some linear combination of uh, the Y intercept, right? a slope for X variable one. So the slope times your score for X, the slope times your score for Y, hmm, plus some sort of error, because we don't ever get anybody totally perfectly. So we did this analysis on um, the Dutch Lexicon project, which is where some of this data is from today, uh, where you were looking at what predicts um, word response times and frequency. <laughs> this is the big one, right? And then um, a couple of other variables. In a logistic model, we're going to switch from y here to g sub y, but then everything else stays the same, in a sense. So let's talk about those differences. A mouse today. So the main distinction between the two is uh, that the dependent variable has now been converted to a logit or log odds of the outcome. So we've got these nice sine curves where we're trying to basically predict the probability of one outcome over another. Um, so in all of these scenarios we're comparing one to another. If you have multiple categorical groups, you're doing multinomial log regression, but it's still one to another, just broken down into multiple equations. Um, so remember that g sub y here is the, the logit, the probability of group two essentially to group one. And we'll get more into that in a second. We can do binomial logistic regression, which is where you have two options. Uh, this is the easiest, so to speak, or more than two options is sometimes called a polytomous regression or multinomial. If you're getting into polytomous regressions, you're almost into uh, item response theory. Almost. Um, so a lot of these uh, analyses are tied together. And it's still regression. It's just regression with a logit instead of a linear equation. So g sub y represents our odds of one choice over another. It no longer represents the actual score of the participant because the score is just yes or no, or one or two, and so now we're just getting a, a probability of group two in comparison to group one. <clears throat> so otherwise everything is the same conceptually. B sub zero is the intercept it's the probability of the outcome when all predictors have dropped out of the equation. So these are almost like prior odds, right? So um, the probability of the second outcome in relation to the first outcome uh, given you know, everything else. Okay. Um, it's not 
expressed in probabilities all the time. It's often um, expressed in odds, uh, log odds. Okay. B sub 1 is going to be our slope for um, the first x variable, or our coefficient. Okay. And B sub 2 would be the second one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we'll talk as we go a little bit more about how one interprets predictors when the outcome is categorical and the data is categorical. So we'll kind of get into like completely categorical data, um, but this analysis is not limited to such. Okay. So in a log regression, the DV has to be categorical, but everything else can be continuous, categorical, and mixed, whatever. Okay. It's a very flexible analysis um, because as long as the DV is categorical, anything else goes. Okay. It's also really flexible because it doesn't have the assumptions of a uh, normal linear parametric, parametric regression. Okay. So it's handy. Okay. Um, the requirements, though, is generally one has to have a very large sample size. Okay. So the, the sample sizes should be large enough in the outcome variable, the dv, and the ratio between them should not be abnormally large. Okay. So we pull up the Rling package. The data set is um, do let, so do in Latin. Okay. Um, and I just made a real quick table of which auxiliary verb it is. So this is our dependent variable. This is like have or get in English. And I, what I don't want to see is a heavy imbalance between one versus the other. Okay. I actually had a friend text me the other day. She was like, how bad does the balance have to be on log regression before it's pointless? Um, she didn't like my answer, I don't think. Uh, but at four to one, it's starting to become problematic. And by the time you're getting up into like six, seven, eight, nine to one, um, you're wasting your time. Okay. Unless the data is sufficiently large, you will always get it right if the ratio is more than six to one. Because if you have 60, uh, let's say you have 60% of the data is one group and 40% is another group. You're going to get it 60% right by guessing group one every single time. And uh, that would be significantly better than a 50 50 odds. Okay, so uh, once you start to get to um, 70 30 and 80 20, you're just, uh, and that's proportionate, not odds, um, it's just really hard, unless you have some really great predictors. You can still try the analysis. Um, but you have to examine the predictors more than the equation. Okay. So uh, 4 to 1 ratio, okay, or you can think about the um, percent in the data and really past 70 percent. Uh, the variables need to be very good or um, you are essentially only going to predict the, the, the larger group just naturally. Okay. Um, none of these are hard and fast rules though. These are just based on experience and math. Um, so here it's 277 to 178, so I can think about that. So the prior odds is 1.5. Hey, that's not bad. That's not 4 to 1, right? Um, and then if I think about the, oops, uh, 277 plus, I know I could do this in R, but I have a calculator, right? It's, this is a 60-40 ratio. So I'll have to make sure that I can actually predict that smaller group. Because if I always guess Latin, I would get it right 61% of the time, which would be better than 50-50. Okay. So in this case, I want to make sure I'm not um, only predicting the larger group. Okay. There are ways that we could check for this. Okay. I would say this split's pretty nice. Okay. Um, and so sometimes the logistic regression is not the best analysis for low probability events, is what I'm trying to say. All right, so we're going to run one of these. And we're going to use RMS um, as a package to use. There are lots of packages that do log regression, and the book suggests RMS. And so I was like, hey, let's try it. We can also use GLM, um, which is in base R. And if you're wanting to do any multi-level model versions of this, there's Glimmer, or G-L-M-M-E-R, which is in the LME4 package. So there are lots of options. Um, 
The RMS package does some cool stuff though, so we're going to look at what it can provide us. Okay. So looking at this data set, what we have is auxiliary here. This is the, the word choice. Each line here is a sentence that someone coded. Okay. The first one's an easy one, what country it came from. Okay. So Dutch is spoken in several countries, either the Netherlands or Belgium here. Um, so which country is using it? This is going to be a nice um, um, cultural verb. What type of causation it is? So we talked about inducive, physical, effective, and volitional. So we can see if our hypotheses work. Um, we can look at the transitivity of the verb as well. So it's intransitive or transitive. Okay. This extra variable was, um, I, I'm not using it in the lecture because it's proof in the book that you shouldn't have variables that are multicollinear. But I feel like hopefully at this point you know this, um, where you don't have perfectly correlated variables in your analysis, or it will blow up. Okay. But if you want proof, you can look at the book and it talks about if you add them together, it, it blows up. Um, so don't use two perfectly correlated variables in the same analysis. So what we've got really nicely is a cultural variable, a semantic variable, and then a grammatical slot variable. We can see which one's the most useful at predicting word choice. So to run the model, this is going to run off the screen and we'll look at it here in a second, but I'm going to use LRM for logistic regression model. The code is sim um, pretty much the same as LM, so DV is predicted by IV plus IV plus IV, comma, data equals data set name. Okay. And then you don't use summary, you just tell it to print. So that's a little different. Okay. Um, and what I want to do, I think I talk about each one, one at a time, but let's look at the output in R here so we can see kind of all of it at once. It's a little bigger. Here. A little bit. There we go. So when I'm looking at the output, um, the nice thing here is the observations are printed out. So I didn't even need that table, but here they are. We're going to talk about the likelihood ratio test here in a minute. This is going to tell us if our overall model is significant, okay. meaning is my prediction better than 50-50. I can look at my discrimination indices, which is a fancy phrase for um, um, R squared, so this is pseudo R squared, come back to that. For rank discrimination indices, we're gonna use C. And then something we're very familiar with, which is our coefficients table. Okay. So you can learn a lot more, since this is a package we haven't used just, oops, a whole lot, by doing question mark LRM. Okay. You can learn a little bit more about what the data is doing. So it actually will allow you to do um, a bunch of different uh, control different control actions. Uh, we're going to focus on just looking at the interpretation, but it will tell you about what all the stats mean, um, the coefficients, etc. Um, and this is put together by Guy Vandy, pretty famous statistician. Um, it gives you some examples to work with. Okay. So, just FYI. <clears throat> Um, so frequency, we can look at by looking just here, right, in the front. Or if you didn't run your table, you can do dollar sign frequency. And this is just a data screening thing. Clearly, you don't want one of them to be zero. And like we talked about a couple minutes ago, you don't want the imbalance to be super high. Uh, overall predictiveness, we're going to use a likelihood ratio test instead of F. And this is a chi-square test. Um, and what it is, is it's a um, comparison of the model with predictors to a model with no predictors. So how much better do we get by adding the predictors, which is the same thing as the F test, um, but it's a chi-square difference test, effectively. Um, so how much did deviance um, or error change by adding the predictors? And so we'd want this to be, if we're using 0.05 or 0.01, we want this to be significant in your traditional interpretation, and it is. Now I can print out all the stats, or if I'm looking at my output, let me make this go back up here, we can see all three pieces right here. So five degrees of freedom, 
Okay, so I'm adding one, two, three, four, five. Now it's only three variables, but because they're categorical, it's five predictors. Gives us a likelihood difference of 271 chi-squares, which is significantly different than chi-square of 5 at p less than 0.05. What that tells me is that my model is better than random noise. Now I need to investigate where and how it's better than random noise. So just like we do this with regular, regular regression, I'm going to explore a little bit more. And I can think about goodness of fit. Goodness of fit is just an effect size. So how well do the mod, does the model and the data fit together? This is still here under stats. And we can talk about R squared, which is here. And that's just difficult to interpret. This technically is Nagel-Kirk's pseudo, pseudo R squared. This is probably the most popular one. There's also McFadden's pseudo R squared. Because R squared is the correlation between predicted Y score and the real Y score squared. So here that's a little tricky because the predicted Y is a logit, right? It's a probability of group two. And actual Y is either group one or group two. So it's called pseudo R squared because it's kind of a take on this idea of how much the variances overlap. Right? How much of the variance in Y are we accounting for by X? Is. Um, so this just becomes hard. 60% of the variance in Y. Well, Y is categorical. So there's no variance in Y. Um, and so people just try to use these as, as comparisons, comparators between models. Um, and think about small, medium, and large in your own research area. If I saw 60, 60, like a R squared of 0.61, I would have thought that I had broken the model and that I'd done something wrong because it was so large. Um, and so I would use this not as a like interpretation point of like, oh, I got 60% of the variance. I would just say this is a rather large effect. So how, what's one that I can interpret better? And that's going to be C for concordance. Okay. So the concordance index um, is a measure of predictive ability, okay, which is generally what we think of for R squared. So for each Y, okay, so for each do or let, we are calculating a G of Y, which is a, a logic curve. Okay. And so that is a probability score, it's a continuous score. And essentially what happens when we calculate C is we take uh, the probability score and put it into a group. So we force a continuous variable to be dichotomous, but the true data is dichotomous. And so if your G sub Y is 62% right, you'll go into group 2. If your G sub Y is 35, you'll go into group 1. However, that gets really tricky right around 50%. Um, I don't know what happens if it's right on 50. I think it maybe goes into group 2. But that would be even odds, but I think it mathematically ends up going to group two because zero is available on the end. Um, don't quote me on this. Uh, but at 51%, even though it's really, you're not sure, right, you go into group two, and at 49%, you go into group one. Then C is just literally the number of times that the predicted group score matches the actual group score, which makes a lot of sense. Right, this is an easy thing to interpret. How many times did we get it right? right. Um, so at less than 50%, this is actually a terrible model because um, a coin flip would be 50-50. And in our particular model, if we guessed group one the entire time, we would get it 61% right. right? Because 61% of the data is group one. Um, or, yeah, the larger group. So... Um, getting it less than chance is one very unusual, um, but that means that you are doing worse than just like flipping a coin. Um, between 70 and 80 percent tends to be considered acceptable. Between 80 and 90 percent is excellent, and above 90 percent you are doing some magic, magic work. I would couch this though and say that this depends on the prior probabilities of the data, right? So if the data is 80% one group, 
getting it 75% right is not good. Um, we can also calculate the probabilities of getting each group right. Okay, this is both groups. Uh, see if we're better at one group than the other. Uh, and it really also depends on the field you're in. So in some fields, predicting at 65% would be very good because normally it's hard to predict. Okay. So these are the rules from the book, but I will tell you that that depends on what you're doing as well. Okay. All right, so under coefficient here, and coef, these are labeled as log odds. And what's the difference between odds and log odds? Odds ratios are centered around one. And this is kind of how I started the lecture. Talking about four to one odds, six to one odds. This is sports betting. Okay. If you like sports, College World Series is on. So much baseball all the time. Party time, right? Um, also, um, whatever, so what are the odds? Like I said, if I'm going to put money down, right? Horse racing, whatever you like. Um, and they're centered around one. So a one to one odds is an equal chance. If you take the log of that, that becomes centered around zero. This becomes much, to me personally, easier to interpret because scores that are positive indicate higher probabilities for, well, I'm going to call this the coded group. Okay. This is group two. Okay. So positive numbers are higher probabilities for the second group. Negative numbers are higher probabilities for the first group or comparison group. And zero is no predictiveness. It's an equal chance okay, because the log of one is zero. Um, so how do I know which one's which? Uh, what you do is you just look at the levels. Uh, and this is the order that they print out in, in the output too. One, two. So when I say group one, I'm talking about Latin here, because they're the first group that comes up. If I say group two, it's Doan. Okay. Generally in R, depending on how it's imported, it's alphabetical order. <laughs> here it's not. Um, and you can switch these. If you have a particular thing that you're interested in to be group two, just reorder them. Um, but my interpretations can be hedged on the fact that Latin is group one, Doan is group two. All right, so I'm looking at these now. What we can do, I just cut and pasted them so we can look at them um, all at once. Generally, the intercept is not interpreted. Okay. Um, what we've got is four categories for causation, um, effective, inducive, physical, and volitional. And so it coded effective as the comparison group. Okay. So when causation is inducive, versus effective, this is a negative one, so it's more likely to be Latin. And I think these are much easier to see when they're categorical like this if you make little tables. So that's what we're going to do. But we could say that this one is significant, non-significant, and all three of these are significant. So let's, let's think about these one at a time. <clears throat> so I printed them out just to kind of help us Remember what we're looking for, coefficient, standard error, z-score, p-value. And so I just made a table of the, of the um, dv by the iv. And so for this first variable, what we're going to do is look at this little four square right here. So effective versus inducive, Latin versus doan. Okay, so both effective and Latin are the first groups. So first of all, this is negative. So that means it's more likely to be Latin when it's inducive, okay, because it's a comparison between group one and group two. And I think if you look at the numbers here, that hopefully seems kind of obvious. When it's inducive, it's more likely to be Latin, and the reverse, when it's effective, it's more likely to be Doan, okay, between these two. And you can see that the category, the, the frequencies here are much larger. The second one is not significant, so that's effective here versus physical. And it's not significant because um, there's no real pattern here, right? Latin just doesn't exist, basically. Um, and then volitional significance, so effective versus volitional, it's also negative. So towards Latin, when volitional. And that one is um, 
also a nice even split where if it's volitional, it's going to be Latin. If it's effective, it's going to be Dylan. Okay. Um, so these make it much easier to interpret, I think. So remember, interpreting here, the negative, the sign of the relationship tells you if it's the first group or the second group. And then the name here is which one, way it's going. So this is Latin it is indu inducing. Okay. And here it's nothing. And here it's Latin is volitional. Now let's look at transitivity and country. And these only have one variable because they're dichotomous. So let me think here. It's negative. Okay, so that means it's towards Latin um, when it's transitive. Now this one's a little harder to interpret because basically the, the, the reason this is significant is because this square is very small. Okay. When it's transitive, it's going to be Latin. So if I look at these two here, it's clearly going to be the top one. When it's intransitive, meh, meh, okay, there's no real clear pattern. Um, and that's why the predictor is not as large, log odds wise, than some of these because they're not seesaw opposites of each other is the way I think about it. Right? So when I look at this little four square here, this one's large, this one's large, these two are small. Yeah, it's built like a seesaw. Um, so when the frequencies are pulled towards the corners, you get larger effects. Uh, what I mean by that is like they're larger in the corners here or here um, and smaller in the off corner. Here, not so much. We have a difference. Um, we can predict that Latin is in here in the transitive one because it's pulled towards the corner, but we don't have a good probably feel for intransitive. So we could run a little chi-square analysis on this. We wanted to. Okay. Um, and then the last one is actually positive, so that's going to pull us towards Doan. Okay. And it looks like if it's um, Belgium, it's going to be Doan. Okay. And that's because of the strong pull from the Netherlands on the Latin side. Okay. So, really, what's happening here is like if it's the Netherlands, it's going to be Latin. And then otherwise, it's probably going to be Doan for Belgium even though I would say here it's pretty even split. So looking at these and interpreting them is the hardest part. If you had a continuous variable, um, like year or something, you would just interpret that as as year goes up, here's the group that's more likely. All right. Now in that first regression lecture, lecture the book actually talks about interactions um, but I kind of left it out because that lecture was kind of long. So we're going to come back to it now and think about how to do interactions or what's called a moderation analysis in uh, this lecture. Okay. Now I could go on and on about moderation. That's one, um, one of my favorite analyses. Um, but what's really cool is there's some built-in visualization packages that allow you to just see the moderation and then you could potentially continue with your analysis. Um, but to do this uh, analysis, we're going to have to switch from our uh, LRM for logistic regression model to, to a general linear model function. Okay. And that's just practically because of um, what we want to, the output we want to see. So um, it's essentially just an R coding issue. So to do that, I'm going to do GLM. I'm going to do my model just like LM. I'm going to do my data just like LM. Here's the new thing that makes it go from a general linear model that's probably um, your normal uh, uh, least squares analysis to a binomial family uh, because the outcome is, is uh, dichotomous. Okay. Uh, so we run model one here. But then now we're going to mix and match between transitivity and country. Because if I, if I knew anything about these countries, I could tell you that one country is more likely to use transitive verbs and intransitive verbs. So there's this interaction here, predicted. So I run both of them. I use the ANOVA function, which does not do an ANOVA. It's always been confusing to me. Thus, it does a model comparison. Specifically, we're going to focus on chi-square. If you leave chi-square out, I think it actually does um, 
a couple of them. Uh, it depends on what you're putting into this, um, but we're just going to tell it, give us chi square. So essentially what happens is this model runs, this model runs, and then it just tells you if there's a difference in their chi-squares, much like if there's a difference in the deviance between a model with no predictors and a model with predictors that uh, LRM gave us. So with one degree of freedom difference for adding the interaction or not having the interaction, we actually see that it's uh, not significant. So maybe there's not an interaction between country and transitivity. But if I wanted to explore this, let's say it was significant, what I could do is create a picture. So looking at my predictors, what I see is pretty much the same pattern that I had before, um, where here, this is actually not significant now because it was a small effect anyway, and that moved into the um, interaction term. Uh, and I have a friend, I saw this recently, and sometimes when they have the stars out here, it's called stargazing. <laughs> this just makes me laugh every time I think about it. But essentially, um, this still wasn't, isn't significant. But what I can see is that uh, what's happening is the effect of country is also maybe a little bit tied up in transitivity. But you know, that's hard to read. So let's think about using the visreg package, so visualizing regression. Oh man, I love this package. Uh, I didn't find this until um, until we did this chapter a couple months ago, the first time I taught this, and I'm just like, every time now, I'm like, can I use visreg? It's really cool, just like cars, influence, plot. Um, what you do is you put in the model with the interaction, you then tell it what variable you want to split on. This is panel, or if you're familiar with ggplot, this is facet, the facet grid kind of thing. Okay, so I want to basically on x split by transitivity. So I've got intransitive and transitive, intransitive and transitive. I want to panel, I'm sorry, this is the panel variable by country. So this is x, this is panel. I follow. Okay. And then y just is. Um, a function of that of x. <clears throat> so what happens here is each little dot is a different um, uh, sentence here and this is a function of x so it's not just Doan or just Latin but what we can see is these are the essentially um, the uh, coefficient effectively uh, so we can what what's happening here this interaction is close, okay, and I hate to use that term because it's a poor interpretation of p-values, but I would say the interaction is small uh, because what's happening is for the Netherlands there's a larger difference between the likelihoods of intransitive and transitive going with Doan versus Latin, okay, so there's a bigger split, whereas in um, Belgium, or Belgium, uh, the country, not the language, um, they're much closer. So that interaction is, is fueled by the fact that this is a larger split than this, but there's a lot of noise, so that's why it's not significant. And so what you expect to see in the interaction plots that have interactions is differences in the size of the effect. You can also do these graphs with uh, continuous variables, and they'll just show you the different slopes for groups. So I would interpret, if I were thinking that this was significant, my interpretation would be for the Netherlands, there's a bigger um, probabilistic difference between intransitive and transitive combinations for do versus let. And in Belgium, there's almost a very small, almost no difference because their um, confidence intervals overlap between uh, the transitive and intransitive verbs for this. So there's just basically no distinction here, and there is a distinction here. And then now I can do my normal kind of um, assumptions view, and we can do the exact same plot that we did for uh, the regression analysis, where we look at car. And plot model one, uh, I do believe you have to have the GLM model for this to work. 
And remember that each bubble represents a different line. And uh, across the bottom here is leverage. This is studentized residuals, so we don't want things past two. That's where they get problematic. Um, larger hat values are more problematic. And the bubble size is Cook's distance, which is a measure of leverage, change in slope, and discrepancy, how far away the data is from other places. Discrepancy here is a little hard because the data cannot literally be that far away. Um, so it's kind of a measure of the weird combination of our categorical variables. And what we see is we have a couple of little outliers. I would probably look at them. I wouldn't exclude them because they're pro unless they're miscoded. Right? This is real data. So it's tricky sometimes because I'm, I'm trained uh, on working with participants and participants are frustrating because sometimes they do what you want in the sense that they took the study seriously and sometimes they're just sticking around and doing whatever they want. So um, generally outliers can be problematic because it can be data points that aren't real. But nice thing about corpus linguistics is that words don't talk back sometimes. And so I would leave them in because they're, they're valid data points. But I might explore why they're the weird data points. <clears throat> And so another assumption is that observations are independent. We don't have correlated error, as in it cannot be both do and let at the same time. That was pretty easy. And that there's no multicollinearity. Right? So if values over 5 or maybe 10 are really bad, um, and hold on to overprediction one second, um, we can calculate our VIFs. Uh, use RMS here. Otherwise, it will give you CAR, more than likely. And none of these are super correlated, or super problematic, so they're not correlated. Um, so what we've decided is that the, the split in the DAV should not be crazy, um, or zero, in the sense of um, if one category is effectively zero, we're going to have a problem. We can look at outliers. We can think about if we want to exclude them or not. The observations need to be independent. It cannot be both things at once. Uh, there's no multicollinearity. You don't have to think about homoscedasticity, linearity, normality. None of that matters. But the harder one to think about is overprediction. Overprediction occurs when one of the groups is way more uh, is is basically perfectly predicted by a variable, and so it's sometimes called complete separation, when one of your variables is perfectly correlated with DV. So essentially one category always predicts a category in the DV. Normally you would think this is good because then you can get it right 100% of the time, but it will cause the math to, to go sideways. Um, Quasi-complete separation is when it's nearly perfect predictor. And when this happens, what you'll see is the standard errors for the, the coefficients will be unusually large in comparison to the other normal standard errors. Okay. So let's go back and look at coefficients real quick. Okay, here are our standard errors. They're all about the same. So this makes, this looks pretty good. So if one of them was 6,000 here, I could tell that something's wrong with that variable. And what I would do is pull it out and try looking at it by itself with the variable, like look at a coefficients, uh, uh, um, uh, frequency table or um, in the case of a continuous variable, look at a plot, maybe, of the two variables against each other, and make sure that you don't have a perfect predictor. Okay. And if you do, you talk about it, and then you test the rest of them. Okay. Um, but that will, if you include it with other variables, cause the model to, to give you um, improbable coefficients. So in summary, and then I want to talk about the assignment because um, this is one that people don't have trouble with, but they always have questions on. Um, we can model word choice. So I can tell you when people are going to pick which one based on country, transitivity, and um, the action in the sentence. I don't even have a word frequency in there. Uh, frequency would drown a lot of that out, <laughs> but if I, I, so that would be something I should include. But in general, like those are just three predictors that gave us 80% uh, of the data. I think I talked about C, but didn't actually tell you what it was. <laughs> so let's look here. Um, 
Let me back up, sorry. So here's C, and I told you what it should be, but none of you told me that, oh, by the way, what was it? Our C was 89. Okay. So we're getting 89% of this right, which is excellent. Okay. Um, so I can predict almost 90% of the time which one people are gonna use based on three simple variables. Okay. That sounded like such the worst, like, you won't believe what happens next, <laughs> right? Um, but that uh, sort of idea is to, to know which work should come next. You can extend this into multinomial if you have multiple more than two options with the mlogit package. Um, the worst thing about mlogit is the setup. And I have a video, um, if you decide you want to do logistic regression and have three categories, I have a video on how to handle mlogit. Um, not required, just if you're interested because we don't have time to cover it in class normally. Um, and then uh, as a, a way to predict probabilistic grammar, we did log regression okay, with a little bit of assumptions and a little bit of understanding the output. And uh, what we'll do next week is we'll think about how do we handle when we expect there to be lots of interactive components in the data because log regression can handle usually like one little interaction or two, but you start getting into multi-way interactions with you know, six, 10, 15 variables, uh, there are better ways, analyses to try. So that's what we're gonna do next week is think about, um, can I predict when a certain word choice will occur if I have a lot of variables that I expect to each um, interact with the others?